Hey, Justin. Hey, Howard. How are you? Good. Hey, how are you? Um, so, so, um, so welcome. Thanks so much for, for being with us uh, today and, and uh, really sharing your incredible knowledge and insights um, for, uh, for Climate Week. Um, Justin, why don't we start with you since you're going to be speaking first. Tell us a little bit uh, about your role uh, at the Natural Areas Conservancy and a little bit about what the Conservancy is if people aren't familiar with the organization. Sure. Um, well, in my presentation, I'll give a, a quick overview of the organization, uh, but my name is Justin Bowers. I am the program manager for natural areas restoration at the Natural Areas Conservancy. Um, and so I oversee a lot of the on the ground restoration projects that we conduct throughout the city um, and also manage some of the research that we work on. Great, thanks. Uh, and Howard, for our uh, longtime uh, viewers, uh, you're a very familiar face, although it's covered today because you're actually in the Prospect Park Alliance office today, right? Yes. Um, so, so again, just remind people what, what your role is at the Alliance. Sure. I'm the forest ecologist with the Prospect Park Alliance, and I do scientific monitoring and research and do a lot of restoration ecology and management work on our sites. And uh, anything in particular that brought you to the park today? Um, well, I had, yes, I had, uh, we're actually sorting some of the planting plants that we got for upcoming planting events um, at our restoration sites. So I was able to uh, kind of put them in a little bit of a recognizable order to make it easier. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, great. Um, well, thanks so much, both of you, for that introduction. But Justin, we're going to turn things over to you. Uh, I want to make sure we have enough time for both of you to give your really um, fascinating presentations. Um, so if you want to pull up your slides, um, and we'll dive right in. OK. Um. Are you seeing the full slide screen or the sharing screen? Or we the... see the full slide screen. It looks great. 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 Um, okay. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've already introduced myself, so I'll, I'll skip that. Today, I am going to be giving an overview of a project we conducted on climate resilient planting pallets and uh, a tool that we made as part of that project called FIRST. And uh, I'm going to start out with a brief overview of the history of the Natural Areas Conservancy um, and then a little summary of some of the previous research that contributed to the Climate Resilient Planting Pallet Project and then talk about the pallets and the first tool. So to start out, um, the NAC, which I, the Natural Areas Conservancy, which I will refer to as NAC from here on out, was founded in 2012. Um, NAC's mission is to restore and conserve the green and blue spaces of New York City in order to enhance the lives of all New Yorkers. We want to advance science-based regional planning, ensure healthy forests, promote coastal resilience, and cultivate volunteerism and community engagement. NAC is a public-private partnership with the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation. We were founded on a similar model to the Prospect Park Alliance or the Central Park Conservancy. Uh, and like all park conservancies, we're privately funded, but we work uh, not in a single park, but within any park in New York City that contains natural areas. New York City has more than 20,000 acres of natural areas spread over more than 50 parks that provide recreational opportunities and ecological benefits to the entire city. When the NAC was founded, some of the questions we initially asked were, uh, what is the condition and distribution of nature in New York? How are New Yorkers experiencing nature? How should we improve degraded forests and wetlands? And how can we ensure that our natural areas are resilient to climate change? One of the initial projects NAC funded was the creation of a new ecological cover map for New York City. Working with the University of Vermont, this map was created using existing uh, GIS data and aerial imagery um, and combined to create this, which is um, a map that features 52 distinct vegetation types. As expected, the majority of land cover is built environment in New York City, but the total built environment is only 60%. The remaining 40% is green space. 27% of the total area of New York is landscape green spaces, parks, yards, and street trees. But 11.6%, almost 20,000 acres, is natural vegetation. So somewhat surprising when you look around New York City sometimes. 
that despite all of the development around 40% of the city is some kind of green space. And this is just another visualization of that information. Of the city's 20,000 natural area acres, 4,800 4, of that is wetlands, 5,700 is grassland, and 10,500 acres are natural forests. Those are still big numbers, and for the purposes of management, the cover map that we created is still pretty coarse, uh, and we wanted to drill down further into the ecological composition of these natural areas. To accomplish that, NAC's first major field research effort was the ecological assessment of New York's natural areas. Um, quick background on natural area management in the city. The New York City Parks Division of Forestry, Horticulture, and Natural Resources has been actively working to restore these spaces for over 30 years. They have made incredible progress in that time through both mechanical and chemical control of, inv of invasive species, as well as extensive planting. Um, the Parks Forestry Restoration Team plants tens of thousands of trees and shrubs in natural areas every year. Um, however, historically, forest management in the city has been necess by necessity driven by available funding. Um, it's sometimes focused solely on street tree planting um, and not on species diversity, uh, excuse me, on, on tree planting and not on species diversity, uh, ecological function or forest composition. Uh, and there's not always a clear enough picture of the health and composition of the city's natural areas to direct restoration holistically or to set targets and goals for restoration citywide. So the purpose of the ecological assessment was to produce the first ever citywide assessment of New York's natural areas to help guide future natural resource conservation efforts for the Parks Department and the NAC. With this assessment, the primary questions we wanted to answer were, how are natural areas distributed and what is the condition of those natural areas? And in answering these questions, we hope to provide a citywide baseline using quantitative data that could then be used to inform management, prioritize resources, and establish goals and targets. Over two summer seasons in 2013 and 2014, we brought on 25 field staff to conduct the assessment. During this time, they collected data from 1,124 plots and visited 53 parks citywide covering 7,200 acres, including both forest and grassland, and established 253 long-term monitoring plots. Um, these plots are 10 meters in diameter, by the way. And through the course of the study, more than 12,000 forest trees were measured, 750 distinct plant species were identified, uh, 1,000 soil samples were collected, and 5,000 photos were taken. And once we had collected all of that data, we began to look at the results and draw some conclusions. New York City's forests are in transition. Uh, while 85% of the forest canopy is comprised of native species, only 48% of seedlings found in the understory are native. The forest community is rich in species diversity, but threatened by herbivory, human impacts, and encroaching invasive species. Overall citywide, 76% of natural area trees are native species, and in composition, the urban natural area forests more closely resemble New York's rural forests than they do the urban forests of street trees and landscape parks. The most common species citywide in the canopy are sweet gum, black cherry, red oak, red maple, and sassafras. You can see, however, that in three boroughs, one or more of the most common natural area species is an invasive. In particular, black locust is prevalent throughout the city. So 76% of trees native uh, citywide in natural areas are native, but once we begin to dig down, you can see that the future forest is trending towards invasive species. Overall, the canopy of the city's forest is around 85% native. However, in the mid-story, we found native species decreasing at only 80%. In the understory, the difference is stark. Only 48% of species found in the understory are native. The majority of species are invasive. This includes the tree seedling layer, as well as an abundant number of woody vines like Japanese honeysuckle and oriental bittersweet. This strongly suggests that New York City's forests in the future are currently trending towards uh, an invasive dominant canopy. Um, another product that came from the ecological assessment, NAC worked with the New York Natural Heritage Program to develop a forest classification system based upon the assessment data. The Heritage Program took the assessment data and put it in a database and used the species composition and abundance data to classify each of the 1,124 plots in the assessment and match it to a U.S. national vegetation classification cover type. Um, 
So the report provided by the Heritage Program includes scientific and common names for the ecological cover type associated with each assessment plot and includes detailed descriptions of both geographical characteristics and species composition of a given plot. Uh, and one other thing that they included um, with that key with that system was a dichotomous key to identify forest cover types in New York City based on the ecological assessment data. Um, so this key starting from the very general questions progresses to very specific choices to identify a forest community type based on species presence and site characteristics. Um, and the key was provided as a physical document allowing one to identify a forest type in the field through observation. And this is a list of the 10 most common forest types found in New York City based on the ecological assessment data. They're sorted here to differentiate upland forest types from maritime and wetland types. And these are the four most common types found citywide based on the number of EA plots they appear in. And this tracks well with what we observe in the field. Uh, oak hickory and oak maple forests are dominant throughout the city's upland areas. So this leads us to the climate adaptive planting palettes uh, we created through a grant from the Wildlife Conservation Society. NAC was awarded the grant for this project in 2016 and we worked on it in 2017 and 2018. Um, the Climate Adaptation Fund from the Wildlife Conservation Society is designed specifically to be an implementation grant, meaning new research should not be part of a project scope of work. So having the ecological assessment data was invaluable here. Um, I spoke a little bit previously about parks 30 year history of restoration. I'll add now that New York City parks has always been very forward thinking in restoration planning. Uh, until recently, trees planted by New York City Parks Forest Restoration Team have had to be both native species and genetically native, sourced from within 100 miles of the city. Um, however, there were not previously any requirements for ecological community-based restrictions. As long as you were planting a native species, you could plant it anywhere in the city. Uh, additionally, until now, there has not been any consideration of future climate conditions in choosing species to plant. The goal of our project was to utilize existing species abundance, community, and response to climate change data to adjust forest restoration pallets at the site level. Uh, New York straddles two ecoregions, the Mid-Atlantic and New England, um, and contains species that are both uh, at the northern end of their range that are more predominant in the south and at the southern end of their range and more predominant in the north. Um, Ecological assessment data on the relative abundance of tree species in New York City's natural areas provided local site data that was compared to regional models on species expected to gain or lose habitat under future climate scenarios, um, allowing for direct application to our urban forests. So developing a tool that combines current climate resilient species lists with local species abundance and distribution data to inform forest restoration sites can help us to shift the trajectory of future forest composition. Um, and in New York City Parks as our partner on this project agreed from the outset to adopt these recommendations in future restoration plantings. Um, measurable climate change is already occurring in New York City. Warmer, drier conditions are becoming more prevalent. Under these conditions, some species native to New York at the southern end of the range will find conditions unfavorable or untenable in the future, while other species at the northern end of the range may find conditions more suitable. Keeping that in mind, we wanted our palettes to consist of species that were resilient to predicted climate change, native to the area, and appropriate to the forest type they are being planted in. Uh, so this is a quick overview of the data sources we used to create the palettes. Uh, across the top, you can see the products I've been describing, the ecological assessment, the heritage program community types, and the dichotomous key provided by the heritage program. And our other primary source of data was the climate change tree atlas. Um, the atlas uses a regression model based on US Forest Service inventory data and climate prediction models. It also factors biological and disturbance response factors that cannot be modeled but are assigned a score based on available data. We use the disturbance factors from the model as part of our scoring mechanism. These factors include response to drought, pollution, invasive species, and temperature gradients. Uh, there are a total of 12 disturbance factors in the disturbance score, as you can see there on the right. 
We also utilize predicted range shift data from the Atlas. Uh, it provides several models for individual species range shift based on climate change scenarios of different severity. So our primary data sources were our own products in the Climate Change Tree Atlas. We also included data from the New York City Parks Forest Restoration Team, cataloging every species they have used for restoration plantings in the past 30 years. And we also included species data from the Greenbelt Native Plant Center. Um, GNPC is the New York City Parks nursery on Staten Island that propagates all of the native plants used in forest restoration projects citywide. We combined all this information into a database that included 223 tree and shrub species, 70 ecological community types, 16 additional data fields, um, data from the ecological assessment and from the climate atlas, and these planting lists from the Parks Department and from GNPC. And all this data went into a lengthy sorting process. Um, to create a planting palette for each of the forest communities present in New York City, we limited the species selected to native woody species. We selected species that were found in a given forest community type or in both the community type and our e own ecological assessment. But we excluded species that were found only in the ecological assessment as they're not necessarily appropriate to a given location. We sorted based on predicted response to disturbance and whether a given species was predicted to gain or lose habitat. And we removed species that fit all of this criteria, but were unacceptable for extenuating circumstances. Um, examples include ash, hemlock, chestnut species, uh, all of which have known invasive predators and are no longer planted in restoration projects. Um, another example would be poison ivy, which is a native woody species that does quite well on its own. And in the end, we had our pallets. Um, one pallet for each community type identified in New York City, uh, of which there are 70. The pallets are organized into tiers, as you can see on the right here. Uh, there are six tiers based on the Climate Atlas disturbance scores and potential rain shift. The highest tiers contain native tree species whose response to disturbance is predicted to be better than the mean value of all species in the Atlas uh, and which are predicted to gain range. The lowest tiers contain species which have disturbance scores worse than the mean and are predicted to lose range under future climate conditions. There's also a seventh tier consisting of native woody shrubs that are appropriate for community type. We did not have any available climate data on shrubs but wanted to include them for the benefit of species composition in restoration plantings. Um, for now, the pallets don't come with specific recommendations for ratios of species to be planted from each tier. This is something that may be incorporated later, but for now, we simply recommend planting more plants in the higher tiers based upon availability. So in future restoration projects, project managers can initially use the dichotomous key provided by the Heritage Program to identify a community type and then reference a planting palette designed specifically for that community type that is both climate resilient and site appropriate. Uh, the key is extremely useful for this, but can also be a little um, clunky in the field. So we decided to try to automate this process further by developing a tool that combines the identification process with the palette selection. Um, so we wanted to make a web-based tool for this to streamline the process. Um, this is a uh, in-browser tool that we created. Uh, it's, it's not an app that needs to be downloaded. Uh, it works on mobile or desktop. Um, if you're interested, I, I'll have this link up later, but that QR code will lead you to the application. Um, and this is the first page of it. We called the tool first uh, after forest identification and restoration selection tool. Um, I won't go step by step through the tool today, but I will run through it quickly um, to give you an overview. And if you have any questions or are interested, you can contact me for more details. Um, basically, the tool recreates the dichotomous key um, as a digital series of A-B choices. Following the key leads you eventually to a national vegetation classification description of the site you're observing. Um, so you, you just go through this process based on observed characteristics of the site or forest around you, um, and you end up at, a, at an endpoint. In this case, this is a uh, red oak sugar maple forest. And you're given then a description of that forest type, which includes the species that you would expect to find there, um, which includes overstory species as well as herbaceous and shrubs and vines. Um, 
And along with that description at the end, you're provided with a link to an appropriate climate resilient planting palette for that community. Uh, here we have the palette for oak maple forest community. You can see in the first tier, we have mainly oaks and maples, which have scored highly for resilience. While in the bottom tier, we have sugar maple, which is very appropriate for this type of forest, but which is at the southern end of its range here and has been identified as being extremely sensitive to future climate conditions. If you click on any species in the palette, you'll be taken to the US Department of Agriculture profile page for each species, uh, where you can get a lot more information uh, about distribution and identification and much more. Uh, very quickly, um, there's a few other buttons in the first tool. The second button provides a list of all of the forest types identified in the city through the ecological assessment. Uh, and so clicking on any of them will bring you to a description of that forest type and a link to the associated palette. So that's for scenarios where you are already um, decided on what kind of cover type you're planting towards and you don't need to do a, a identification process. And then there's a final button uh, that contains what we refer to as regional palettes. Of 70 community types identified in New York City, 38 of them are native forest types that have associated palettes. Um, 32 are either non-forest communities like grasslands or, and marsh, or they're successional forest types that are dominated by invasive species. So you wouldn't want to emulate these uh, invasive communities. Um, so for these instances, we made three sort of broader categories. Um, if you identify one of these communities, uh, one of these successive successional communities, it will, the tool will either tell you just don't plant here, uh, or it will take you to one of these three regional selections. There's an upland, a maritime, and a wetland forest palette. Um, these palettes are amalgamations of all the cover types that are broadly related. So for instance, in this regional maritime forest palette would contain all species from any maritime cover type of which there's about 15. Uh, and then just very briefly, this is how the tool looks on the, a desktop browser. Um, and using it in this context can be helpful as well if you have previously collected species data in the field that you want to try to key to an ecological community type or identify a palette for after the fact. Um, so if you're interested in looking at the tool yourself, this again is the QR code, uh, or you can visit naturalareasnyc.org slash climate. Um, I, I know I just ran through a lot pretty fast. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah, th thank you, Justin. And we actually have a, a couple of questions uh, here. Um, so uh, Brittany asked the question, what is the time frame for the climate adaptation species palette? And so how far in the future are these palettes looking? Oh, um, that's a really good question. Uh, so the climate change tree atlas data, um, as I said, they have different models um, and they're it provides models for individual species over different timescales and different severities of um, climate change. So we um, selected a sort of moderate uh, model for climate change and it's looking at change over the next 25 years. Um, thank, thank you so much uh, for, for that question. Uh, we just got a question from uh, Ronan who says, are there any rules or regulations about planting uh, invasive trees, shrubs, or bushes, say, in your own backyard in New York City? Uh, no, there are not. <laughs> um, and, uh, and that's, I mean, I, I think one of the primary vectors of invasive species everywhere, not just in New York, are backyard plants and ornamentals that get distributed by, you know, birds and the wind. Uh, and, you know, is there any place that people can go to just as a you know, maybe as a, as a homeowner um, where you can get, um, you know, recommended pallets on a much smaller scale, you know, for your own backyard gardening? Sure. Yeah. So we've, um, that, that's something that we have uh, talked about doing, exp you know, these 
cover these ecological cover types identified by the National Vegetation Index um, contain not just trees, but as I said, shrubs, herbaceous species, vines, and they weren't included in this first round of pallets because first of all, we were focused on forest restoration and um, we, there wasn't the same readily available climate data to apply to those species. Um, but we have been talking about potentially expanding the pallets to include those species and doing that by um, you know, several methods, one of which might be just taking into account how um, plant hardiness zones have shifted in recent years and applying that to the, to the herbaceous and shrub species. And that would be more applicable to backyard settings. Great. Um, we also had a question um, from Andrew who wants to know if, if this presentation or some version of this uh, presentation that you gave today is available anywhere. Um, um, I, I don't know if we have a copy of this presentation online, um, but if you want to reach out to me uh, at this email address, I can uh, definitely provide something. Great. Um, well, Justin, thank you so much uh, for that really fascinating presentation. It's such an, an amazing tool. And, and what we're going to do next is we're going to kind of shift scales a little bit. So we're going to go from looking at the citywide scale um, and we're going to uh, shift to looking at uh, one area of the city and looking at Prospect Park and how it's been impacted um, and how they're planning um, for climate change. So I'm just going to invite um, uh, I'm just going to invite Howard on. But Justin, if you can stick around, if we have any other questions um, for you, uh, hopefully um, people can drop them into the chat. Um, so uh, if you think of something during Howard's presentation, uh, the question for Justin, feel free to drop it in there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Howard, let's. let's bear with us for one second here. Hey, Howard. All right, welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so let's uh, let's pull up your your uh, slides here. So if you joined us uh, a little bit uh, late this morning or this afternoon, um, Howard is the forest ecologist for the Prospect Park Alliance. And so now while we looked at um, a lot of different ecosystems, not just forests uh, across New York City, we're now gonna uh, drill down um, and look at um, the impacts of climate change uh, and how you're adapting to those challenges uh, in Prospect Park. Thank you. Okay. So, of course, climate change is challenging the entire world, New York City, um, and there, we're seeing the effects of global climate change right here in Prospect Park. And some of the challenges that we're facing in terms of management and how we're actually going to deal with it are, of course, the increased temperatures, changes in rainfall and seasonal stream flow, less snow in the winter means less moisture being held over until the spring, wetter soils in winter. It means that their runoff and stream flow is going to be less in the springtime and it's going to get soggier in the winter, which has an effect on a lot of things. A, there's a longer growing season. Um, anecdotally, for sure, we are noticing as the years progress, leaf out is earlier and earlier and frosts are coming later and later. And Unfortunately, one of the problems is that, is that invasive plant species, which by kind of definition are very adaptable and very aggressive or, and very often um, sprout earlier than native plants and can grow faster than some native plants are benefiting strongly from this. So this is something that can also have a very negative effect on the plant communities. Uh, could you go back one, I'm sorry. Uh, seasonal pattern changes, phenology, basically mismatched events, offsetting life cycles. So for example, um, you know, birds migrating through an area and historically it's matching the time of year when sh uh, shrubs are, are fruiting or grasses are seeding and it's providing a, a food source for them. If these events are becoming mismatched because uh, climate change is affecting 
um, physiological patterns. This can be very bad. It can be very, very detrimental, even in cases where it's not complete. So it's not necessarily, even if it's not necessarily the case that uh, bird migration misses, let's say, fruiting, you know, the fruits coming into ripening entirely. Um, it still can be catastrophic if they're not getting, if they're not arriving at the time where there's the most fruit at its most nutritious. Even a few days can matter, especially to creatures like migrating birds or to insects that are emerging or going to go dormant soon. And it can have a very strong effect as well as many other things that can have examples. Uh, drier summer soil, wetter winter soil, and just more extreme weather events. The most extreme in recent memory, of course, being uh, Superstorm Stent. Super Storm Sandy, which had a very profound effect on the park. The photo on the bottom there is just one little example of an area that was devastated by Sandy and the giant trees that fell. Um, this is just a map to give you a sense of changes in leaf dates when the when leaf out occurs. And if you look at kind of where Brooklyn is, if you look where we are, it's the most extreme. It's between four and eight days. So we're definitely um, seeing a change in phenology and a change in climate right here. Next, please. Just another little example. This is, you know, very much in line with uh, what Justin was talking about. Rain shifts of plants, um, the community like the maple beech birch communities, as it's been recorded in the recent past, are projected to recede further north, practically really not on, really not dominant in the United States anymore, according to this. Um, Aspen birch is, is going to recede north and it's going to be just massive vegetation changes projected. Next, please. It affects all kinds of organisms. Uh, just some threatened birds of New York State showing the, the Atlantic Flyway. A lot of birds fly over Brooklyn. Prospect Park in particular is extremely important because it's a big green space in the middle of a very uh, built up space. You know, birds funnel into Prospect Park. And they're very, and as I said, they're they're here for a very specific amount of time, particularly again migratory birds. And when events do not match up, um, there can be very big problems for them. Next, please. Just another example of this that, um, according to Shu et al., the sixth most common or the sixth worst factor in migratory bird declines is climate change and severe weather that it brings. Next. There's a lot of problems, obviously, with climate change, and we're seeing a lot of, there's a lot of potential problems that are coming to this area, and we're already seeing some effects. Uh, Prospect Park is extremely important ecologically and extremely important in terms of mitigating climate change in Brooklyn. Um, this is based on TreeKeeper, and based on 15,741 calculated trees, and I will say that the total number of trees in the park is estimated to be about 30,000. This was based on certain criteria of tree size and distance from paved surfaces. Um, so the actual numbers below really are higher, not necessarily double per se, but um, are actually would be higher than even what's projected here. Totally yearly eco benefits from the forests of Prospect Park is over $2 million. Uh, greenhouse gas benefits, um, very relevant relating to climate change. Um, the, uh, $16,926.58, um, 3,147,220.94 pounds of carbon dioxide avoided, 2,596,828.77 2, pounds of CO2 sequestered by all the forest land. So that's a lot of greenhouse, that's a lot of carbon dioxide that is um, being sequestered or avoided from going into the atmosphere. Next, please. And again, and uh, water benefits, and again, this all relates back to climate change in the sense of what we were talking about, about uh, um, changing rain patterns and snow patterns and flooding. Um, benefits economically, it's $181,297.24. Um, the park saves the city 22,662,155.45 gallons of water. Um, you can see the energy benefits. I'm not going to necessarily read through it all. People can see it. But if you look at it, there's really a lot. There's a tremendous amount of um, economic and environmental importance to the park. And you can see how a lot of these things, you know, as CO2, water, to energy, relates to climate, potentially to climate change. 
Um, so we have a question, which is, I, I think some of the benefits like sequestering CO2 uh, and air quality benefits are probably pretty obvious um, to people. Um, what about some of these other things in here, like water benefits and, and energy benefits? I know this isn't, you didn't make these calculations, but if you could just speak a little bit more generally about what that, what that kind of means. Yeah, um, one of the big things would be like water benefits. So one of the big problems that New York City has and a lot of cities have is, um, is flooding, is, um, um, I forget the, the term for it, but basically when the sewers cannot accommodate the, the water flow that comes into it and, it and it backs up and comes back out again, we have uh, all kinds of issues because of paved surfaces. Uh, Prospect Park is able to prevent a lot of flooding by absorbing the water into natural areas, into, into the ground, directing water flow into, into the lake. Um, uh, it helps to purify some, a lot of the groundwater because of the biological processes and the plants that, that are there. So there's a lot of other benefits as well that uh, goes into that. Yeah. The, the term you were searching for is the combined sewer overflow. So that's yeah, I just couldn't, a, new, a lot of New Yorkers are very familiar with that. Yeah. So yeah, that's a that's an obvious benefit. Um, John also asked, um, what's the difference between CO two being sequestered uh, and CO two being avoided? I believe that uh, sequestered is that the trees are taking up CO two that otherwise would remain in the atmosphere. Avoision, I th what I think it means is that the presence of Prospect Park and the presence of these green areas, um, it's taking the place of presumably what, what would be here otherwise. And again, I'm not sure exactly how this is done, but I would imagine they look at the surrounding areas and then extrapolate, you know, you know based on that, if these types of, whether it's industrial or, or um, roads or uh, residential areas, what would be um, um, carbon the carbon dioxide, yeah, um, be from that. So I think that's what ablation is. Yeah, and I know we have a lot more ground to cover, but I, I, we do have one other question, uh, which, is, which is really good, um, which is, um, could you speak a little bit to how um, some of these benefits are localized? Uh, so Brittany, Brittany asks, like, how, how are these... Um, ecosystem services benefiting the immediate area versus looking at the kind of bigger climate picture or the impact on the city in general? Sure. Well, one of the most important things is that we know that trees are very important in urban environments to, uh, to, co to cool areas, that cityscapes that have very few trees are much, are much hotter, stay hotter longer. Um, this causes people to use more air conditioning and use more energy. It also, not everybody has air conditioning and it's tremendous health risks to people. And there are parts of the country where, during heat waves where people who um, don't have the benefit of being able to use more energy uh, suffer terribly and we have fatalities and very serious things. Um, so the presence of trees uh, helps cool cities and um, it definitely the canopy cover that we have in Prospect Park um, does provide um, uh, provides benefit to people both um, coming into the park. It's kind of a green space that people can come into and kind of an oasis where uh, uh, temperatures are going to be cooler than on the surrounding pavement. And it does cool a lot of the area immediately around uh, the city immediately around it. Same thing similar with the with the water. Um, all of the um, all of the flood waters are uh, that Prospect Park takes up that is all water that is not flooding into the streets in the immediate area. Um, and so it's absolutely preventing uh, flood, uh, flood damage and um, sewage backup and overflow. Great, that, thanks so much for, for sharing that. And thank you, uh, keep your questions coming. Uh, but we'll go to the next slide. Yes. So mitigation strategies for woodland management. That's mostly what I want to talk about is, uh, you know, Prospect Park, it's very important in so many ways. It's very important for the city and it helps with mitigation of climate change. And how do we at Prospect Park, how are we thinking about climate change? How are we thinking about the challenges and what are we doing about it to manage the healthy forest? 
Um, I'm going to go through these uh, um, as we continue talking. I'm going to go into these in more detail, but just to run down the list, managing, we manage for healthy tree density in forests and vigorous trees, diverse age structure, target and remove vines, plant high diversity of species, tree species predicted to respond well to climate change and disturbance from the NAC palette. We've been very fortunate to be working closely with NAC over the last few years um, on this project and we are um, using their recommendations to restore forests, connecting different habitats and trying to make smaller blocks of woodland into larger areas that would have a continuous canopy cover. Adaptive arboriculture, I'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk about pests, but an example is not pruning oaks in the summer. Um, and I will explain later um, what that means and how it relates to climate change. Um, erosion and flood control and monitoring and controlling invasive species. Next, please. So forest health overall, one of the most important things we can do is in order to manage, we need to know what's going on. So we monitor forest health. Um, we've been using the rapid site assessment system that is um, a function of the NAC to get a sense of the health of our forests. We're also using other vegetation monitoring plot surveys, all of these things to get a sense of, you know, what type of forest do we have, what, what is the state of their health, what are the things that are affecting them. Reforestation is a big deal. We do a lot of restoration work all over the park and some of our most exciting projects are taking areas that were not forested at all and kind of starting forests from scratch. All of the photos that you see uh, on this slide came from an area called, called the Bartell Forest. It's um, between Bartell, it's on um, Prospect Park, it's along Prospect Park West between Bartell Circle heading towards the Banshell area. This was an area that consisted of a few older established mature trees, some, many of them not native, ginkgos, London plains, some native things like oaks and, uh, and maples but you, it was basically trampled flat. It, was, it wasn't really even grass. It was a very compacted, uh, completely open area where the only plants really were these you know, 80 year old trees that had always been there. And if you look, and um, it's really been transformed now uh, into a forest and it's still in progress, it's growing, but instead of just being these big trees, it's now these big trees with with a mid-story that's growing up. Native trees are going to be the next generation of big canopy trees. Um, we have a wonderful ground layer of uh, native herbaceous vegetation. And this was an area that really was uh, very degraded and was not providing any kind of um, benefits vis-a-vis -vis climate change to people as an area that was just really barren. And now it's becoming a forest. Um, we look to maintain healthy tree and shrub density in the areas that we restore. Trees and plants compete with each other, of course, and uh, it doesn't really help long term to just plant tons and tons of trees or shrubs right next to each other. We, you know, some mortality is expected. Um, so we, um, so maybe some, you know, you, you know, sometimes you plant more than, you know, the absolute minimum of what you would expect to have but you try not to overplant that you give trees space to grow to utilize resources without the intense competition um, we are managing for a high canopy cover which again cools the park and the surrounding areas and another major thing is removing vines um, particularly invasive vines of course uh, large vines can smother and completely engulf trees on the bottom uh, on the bottom corner that that green uh, monster you're looking at is all porcelain berry that is a non-native invasive vine that is completely smothering that little area there. Um, the other one, uh, the ivy that you see on the bottom left, on my left, um, that's also a very, very common invasive vine in the park. And in addition to invasive vines smothering trees outright, even when they don't, they weaken the trees and they make them much more susceptible to damage during storms. And as we are having now increased storm activity and extreme weather events from climate change, um, it's the presence of vines makes it worse. So that's something that another thing that we do to try to prevent uh, some of the negative effects of, of the climate change. 
ecologically, uh, we plant diverse species. We're trying to prevent monocultures. We plant species resilient to climate change, again, as per the NAC palette. Examples are we are now, we are really looking to uh, plant oaks, hickories, black arms, sweet birch, red maple, very resilient trees native to the area that are part of the native forest types of this area. Reduce or eliminate planting of trees predicted to decline in the area due to climate change. Uh, red maple and American beech are beautiful, beautiful trees, but unfortunately they are not predicted to do well. We're hoping that we are, that some of them do stay within the park, but they, but we are not um, planning forest management around them because all the evidence really shows that they are not going to fare well and their range is going to recede north. Um, and also, as kind of as Justin mentioned, um, we also avoid things like ash, which again, great tree, but unfortunately it has, it has uh, emerald ash borer. We also have a disease called ash yellows and ash is, a, is, is just a bad bet for, for a future forest because of, what, because of the, 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 the danger that, it, that it's in from, from pests and pathogens. Uh, we try to connect habitats to create larger areas and to facilitate genetic flow between organisms and allow movement between organisms. This is movement of animals and also movement of plants as, uh, you know, seeds of native things that fall in dirt instead of on pavement uh, allow for regeneration and keep the genetic, you know, and, and flow of genetics. Um, and diversify plants with high wildlife value. Uh, the, the bird is a waxwing. I admittedly, I can't tell, I'm sure a bird or can, I can't tell whether it's bohemian or cedar, but it's eating um, the red winter berries. So we do know what plants have very, have very high value to wildlife, um, or particularly high value to different types of wildlife because they produce ber berries or seeds or they, produce, or they sustain a huge insect population um, or they're host species to insects. And we try to diversify these types of plants, so to kind of hedge our bets and give wildlife the options in a changing, in a changing environment. Next, please. Erosion and flood issues. Uh, we use cribbing and water bars. We do some water testing just to get us make, maintain a sense of uh, water quality in the park. Um, Bioswales are a very big deal. It's basically areas where water runs off into and it's planted with. Um, uh, with wet tolerant plants. It's kind of a, I will say that there's a, a lot of misconceptions about bioswales. Most bioswales are not permanently flooded or covered in water. They're usually dry, but when there is a rain event or a big runoff, um, it, you know, it, it, can, it can temporarily become wet. It holds a lot of water in the soil. Um, planting on slopes to prevent, to hold soil and prevent erosion. Anytime there's bare areas, um, we are looking to Keep it, uh, keep it in place with, with uh, the root systems of plants, directing water into the unpaved surfaces, and keeping water flow into the park. Again, trying to direct runoff and landscape in a way where when we have major flooding events or runoff, um, we're trying to keep it out of the surrounding cityscape as best we can and provide venues for it to go into the water course, into the unpaved surfaces and woodland areas of the park into bioswales that are strategically placed. Next. Uh, well, we just had a question here, okay. Howard, um, which is, uh, since we're speaking about uh, water, uh, water issues, someone asked about um, if anything is being done um, to reduce the uh, uh, algae blooms uh, in the waterways of the park. And, um, you know, I, I know that's a little bit of a different issue because you're, you're dealing with city water, right? But is there anything um, where, you know, the forest management might have something to do since the water course runs through the main, the heart of the forest in Prospect Park. Yes. So as you mentioned, the, the waterway in Prospect Park begins as a waterfall and, become, and flows into pools, which exit as a stream, which flows into the main lake. And a lot of people don't necessarily realize this. It's all New York City tap water. Uh, New York City tap water is very high in phosphorus, and phosphorus is a nutrient that promotes tremendous algae growth. So it's an issue that we are struggling with and uh, any, uh, I think all parks and green spaces that utilize city water are struggling with. Um, we do a lot of testing for, uh, for HAB, for the hazardous algae blooms and post it for, for human safety. And as far as prevention, one of the things we're working on right now, and I can't talk too much about it because it's still, we're still working on it, 
Um, um, but we have an, we're calling an eco weir in the adjacent to the area where the initial waterfall comes out. And it's trying to redirect some of the water into this area that we're trying to create as a wetland. And by using certain plants that are known to, to take up car, um, phosphorus very well, we're, we're going to be measuring that, seeing how well they do it. And then based on the results, if feasible, we may be able to um, expand some of these concepts to larger to a larger area that may have a notable effect on the on the phosphorus in the park and lower algae blooms. So that's a, a long term project. Yeah, and we'll 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 keep people posted. We've been talking about doing a program about it once once it's kind of up and running or getting close to it. So um, if uh, you know the area, it's just a little bit north of the the baseball fields um, uh, in the in the long meadow. Um, Another question we had here is that given the high traffic uh, in the park, are there any moves to plant uh, native shrubs or trees with food value? I presume, uh, Brittany, your question is food value to, to humans, um, or maybe it's, maybe it's to animals. Um, but you mentioned that, uh, she says yes for people. Now I should say, right, that for, you're not allowed to forage in New York City parks, right? Most of, and for that reason, most of the, when we plant food plants, we are thinking in terms of, of the wildlife. Um, but you know, I know that there's certainly a lot of edible plants that people are, are aware of. And one thing that's good is that some of the plants that people uh, take frequently are non native invasive plants. Like a lot of people use mugwort. And while you're technically not, I guess, not allowed to, if anyone wants to take mugwort, garlic mustard, or any of these other invasives that are causing trouble for our forest, you're welcome to those. <laughs> this is just a quick uh, visual. This is actually one of the bioswales we have in the park. It's on the uh, east side of the park. Um, it's not the best, it might be hard to see from the picture, but it's basically a big area where um, channels are dug so that the water really flows instead of flowing onto the onto the pavement it flows down into this um, kind of this bowl that's been created and these are all the plants and the uh, the close-ups um, on my right on the lower side of the orange flowers that is uh, jewelweed which is a it's not a wetland only plant but it tends to like wet areas so it's a great bioswale plant this actually came in naturally um, in addition to things that were planted. So just an example of some of the things that we're doing that you may not notice. You may have passed this a million times and never known what it was, but it's actually um, uh, preventing uh, uh, flooding from storm surges. Next, please. Invasive species are a big deal. Uh, increased CO2 levels have been linked to the spread of invasive plants, that so they're able to use it faster in some cases than natives. Uh, longer growing season may favor the invasives. Many pests historically have been controlled by cold winter temperatures and winters are not getting cold enough anymore to kill them or kill them in sufficient numbers and it's becoming a very big problem. Uh, the, the beetle picture that I have is a uh, uh, I may have gotten that wrong. It's a beetle that uh, is, is unfortunately is a major vector of a fungus that causes the disease oak wilt, which is a very serious threat to oak trees. These beetles are attracted to um, fresh wounds in trees. They feed on the sap, the, and then they, the fungal spores get on them, and then they transmit it to other trees. This is a very, very bad uh, disease of oak trees. Oak trees are one of our most important trees for a lot of reasons. One of the most important being they are uh, considered very resilient to climate change and are cons considered to be a very good tree to be planting for, uh, to mitigate future climate change in, in our forests. And uh, that's where, when I mentioned earlier about arboriculture, we don't cut in the summer, particularly to avoid attracting this beetle. We try to, if we need to cut limbs or things on oak trees, we do it in the winter when the beetle isn't around, but the, one of the potential problems is as winters get warmer, beetles may be out longer and longer. Winters may not be killing them. If we get um, warm spells, sometimes things wake up temporarily. Uh, so it can be a problem. Um, and climate change just allows a greater range of potential invasives, things that, will, you know, things that historically the winters would kill them or the rainfall patterns weren't conducive to them. And as that changes, it just opens the door for more and more types of things to be able to invade 
our forests and uh, some of which will will uh, survive and stick and become new additional bad invasives. Next please. For invasive control, you know, we monitor and report invasive plants, pests, and pathogens. We have the most, here at the Prospect Park Alliance, we have the most direct control over plants more than the other things, but we monitor and report to the proper authorities. Um, we do adaptive management for um, that, uh, again, the, uh, the change in uh, the way we handle oak trees, as I mentioned before. We don't transport wood from other locations into the, into the park, as there's no New York State in general you're not, you're not supposed to do. Um, we actively remove invasive plants and restore with natives, or, um, and we manage the forest to minimize and prevent disturbed areas that are most conducive to invasion. We're trying to create, this goes hand in hand with the healthy forests and healthy ecosystems and other habitat types. The more disturbed an area is, the more conducive it is for invasives to come into it. So uh, as we have healthy, you know, more self-sustaining systems that are taking over larger areas, that's what we want, makes it uh, less inviting for invasive species to come into it in the first place. And this is just a final slide. This is just on uh, Lookout Hill. This is something that, this is an area that was planted by uh, the Hurricane Sandy crew, which was a capital project for a number of years. This was all, this was a lot of this was a vine jungle and it was uh, after Sandy, trees were down and it was really a mess. And this is just one little view of a much bigger area that's now completely planted up with trees, shrubs, herbaceous. Uh, it's a really beautiful uh, restoration project. And I um, just wanted to conclude with that because it uh, kind of encompasses so much of what we've been talking about in terms of trying to maintain healthy forests and um, the species chosen, the woody species chosen are in accordance with the NAC palette. And uh, this is going to be a continuation of a larger forested area. And this of course is an area that people maybe may remember where, where we had goats grazing a couple yep. of years ago to help, help with that, uh, you know, re replanting and getting rid of those, uh, those invasive species. Um, but thank, thank you so much uh, for sharing that. We're, we're just about out of time, um, but I just want to uh, invite uh, Justin uh, back on. Um, and if we have, see if we have any uh, last, uh, last questions here before we wrap up. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess the question that, that I have um, is, you know, we talked about the different, you know, composition of, of the, the, the species in the forest um, and the, the palace that you're looking at and adapting to climate change. But as just a regular, you know, user of the, of New York City parks day to day, you know, as we look ahead the next, you know, 10, 15, 25 years, what are some of the, you know, changes that we can expect to see in the way we, you know, interact with, with the parks in New York City? Well, um, it's hard to know for sure in terms of, of trends that, that we're seeing in Prospect Park. Uh, unfortunately, um, as I mentioned, ash trees are not doing well. Um, that's a, you know, it's, it's a historic tree that uh, has been an important part of the forest system, but may not be uh, in 25 years. Uh, we may see fewer sugar maples, fewer beech. So we're gonna see some, you know, some species that were once, um, common or well-known or we may see less of. Things that we may, may be uncommon now or have never seen before may start coming into the forests. Um, new you know, species that are extending their range northward. Um, we're definitely seeing leaf out earlier, things like that. But we're very optimistic because the truth is um, we are working very hard with within our organization and very hard with um, with the NAC and use, utilizing the, uh, the fantastic resources they're providing to not be reactive, to be proactive. Uh, we, know, we know that climate change is happening now. It's already had an effect. It's going to have an effect. And based on the available science, rather than wait for catastrophe and then scramble to try to put the pieces back together, we are actively managing for the future and making decisions based on the science that we're provided and you know it's adaptive management it's always going to throw curveballs there's going to be new things we didn't expect but we'll adapt to that and uh we are very uh optimistic that the future of prospect parks forests are going to be healthy forests that are continuing to provide these important benefits for everybody 
Yeah, Justin, any, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I would uh, I would agree. It's it's difficult to say with any certainty um, what the next twenty five years will bring. There's always going to be new invasive species and new challenges. Um, you know, spotted lanternfly wasn't a thing until last year, and and in the next couple of years, that's going to be a major management issue. Um, I would say that the Parks Department and NAC published uh, a forest management framework last year that is a guiding document to address this very thing. It's to guide uh, management of all the city's forests citywide over the next 25 years. Um, and as Howard said, it's an adaptive uh, management approach, um, but it is something that is being planned for and it's, it's something that I'm also optimistic will be addressed. And I'll just say, um... We are in the midst of creating all our, you know, Prospect Park Alliance's 25-year management plan, which, of course, is based very heavily off of the recommendations and information of the forest management framework. So, of course, it's going to mirror all of these things that uh, you've been doing, and you know, we're looking forward to continuing to integrate Prospect Park into the greater, um, you know, uh, habitat of New York City. Great. Well, thank you all both uh, so much. Um, and uh, I'll just add that um, if anybody is interested in any of these resources that we dropped into the chat or we mentioned in the two presentations, uh, we'll be sharing all of those on our website. So you can go to turnstiletours.com um, and you can find in our past programs page, you'll find the video uh, if you missed uh, the first part of this. Um, that you can watch uh, and also you can find uh, links to all of those resources. And I'll just mention one more time that if uh, you want to join us uh, for our next program on Saturday, uh, we're going to be actually going into the park. Uh, so we're going to um, be working with an organization called Adaptability to talk about adapt adaptive uh, bicycling uh, for people with disabilities. Um, just highlighting the incredible range of activities uh, in Prospect Park and what an important resource it is um, not just for these incredible ecosystem services, but really as, as Brooklyn back, Brooklyn's backyard. Um, but thank you both so much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Um, and, and thank you again for, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. All right.